Hey everyone, I'm Mike Sattel, an SAT and ACT specialist, and this is the second video in a series about the biggest problems that most students face when they prepare for these standardized tests. In our first video, which I definitely recommend you watch, we talked about how the SAT and ACT are different from the tests that you usually take in school. And if you change how you think, you'll change how you score. In this video, we're going to talk about what to do if you're feeling overwhelmed by the scale of the SAT and ACT. But before we get too deep into it, I want to remind you to subscribe to this channel so that you never miss a new video. I post free lessons and tips, and subscribing lets me know that they're helping. You should also follow me on Instagram for free daily test prep. You may also have noticed that this video is much longer than the last one, and that's because we're going to do a full free lesson. The best way to follow along is to visit my website and download the free workbook. You can print it out and actually do the practice problems on paper. It's a much better experience than just watching the video. Also, if you own a copy of my math SAT packets prep book, then you already have these notes and you might already know the solution to this standardized testing problem, what to do if you're feeling overwhelmed. The SAT and ACT test a lot of topics. But remember, we can change how we think about these tests. If you see the SAT as one massive test of everything that you know, it's going to stress you out. But if you think about it as lots of little tests, you can break it down into more manageable pieces. In other words, the solution is to narrow your focus to a few small topics at a time. Let me show you what I mean using the SAT math section, which consists of 58 questions. It's a 20 question no calculator section and a 38 question calculator section. Now in the rest of these videos, I'm going to keep using the SAT math section to help me make my points, basically because it doesn't involve long passages, so it's a little easier to jump from one point to the next. But all of the big picture ideas I'm talking about will also apply to the SAT reading and writing, as well as all of the sections on the ACT. For now, let's take a look at how the SAT breaks down the math section. They divide these 58 questions into four question types. Heart of Algebra, Problem Solving and Data Analysis, Passport to Advanced Math, and Additional Topics. Personally, I don't think these are very helpful. These groups are very vague, so I break the 58 questions down like this. Charts and Graphs, Arithmetic, Algebra, Properties, which I'll talk about in the fourth video, Models, which is the topic of the fifth video, and Geometry, which is the topic of this video. Now, this is about the level of detail that I expect most of my students to understand the test, but I actually break it down even further. Each of these abbreviations represents a specific question type, and this is approximately what the breakdown for an average SAT looks like. If it seems a little crazy and overwhelming, well, that's because it is. They cram a lot of stuff into only 58 questions. And if you just keep taking practice test after practice test, you're going to have a hard time recognizing the patterns that make test 1 similar to test 8. So as much as possible, you want to narrow your focus and just work on a bunch of the same type of question in a row until you've mastered that type. Let's really narrow our focus to just one type, part over whole questions. These are geometry questions, but specifically they're about parts of circles. And by my count, seven out of eight of the official SAT practice tests released by the College Board have a part over whole question. In other words, if you can nail this topic down so that you know how to solve it every single time, you're basically guaranteeing yourself 10 points on every SAT. And that's why we narrow our focus. You're much more likely to learn the pattern that will help you solve part over whole questions if you're only focusing on this one type without the other 57 math questions distracting you. Even if you're only improving your score 10 points at a time, you'll be amazed at how quickly those points add up. My hope is that by the end of this video, you know exactly what a part over whole question looks like so that you can instantly know when you see one on the test and so that you automatically know how to solve it even when it's all twisted up. But first, let's take a look at the basics. And for the rest of this video, I'm going to use the iPad a lot, partly because it makes it easier to show my work, but also so that you know that when I'm looking here, you should be looking here. I'll put all of the examples and questions up on the screen, but remember, you can download all of them for free from my website. It's much easier to follow along and do the problems yourself 
if you've got your own copy of the free workbook. Let's get to it. The basics. A quarter of a circle contains a quarter of the degrees, a quarter of the area, and a quarter of the circumference. Use ratios to compare these attributes no matter what the fraction. So if we had a circle where the shaded part is one-fourth of the whole circle, we could make a bunch of ratios that would reflect that and they'd all be in the form part over whole. And let's just say the radius is four, that'll just make it easier here. The first thing that I usually notice about the shaded parts here is that the number of degrees is gonna be a fairly easy ratio to make because we always know that the whole number of degrees in a circle is 360. So the angle for this shaded part is gonna be a fourth of that, which is 90 degrees. We can also think about the shaded area as well. The whole area of this circle is 16 pi, because our radius is four, and a quarter of that is going to be four pi. And lastly, we can do the exact same thing with the circumference. We know that the part, the arc in this case, is going to be 2 pi, and that the whole circle, the whole circumference, is going to be 8 pi. And no matter what here, we're doing the same thing. We're talking about one-fourth of the circle. The ratio is consistent because we're always comparing the part to the whole, and the part doesn't change size. So it doesn't matter that we're talking about degrees or area or circumference, it's always a fourth of the circle. And that makes sense, right? It makes sense that it should be consistent. If we had a quarter of a pizza, it would have a quarter of the crust, a quarter of the sauce, a quarter of the cheese. It's the same portion of the pizza no matter what. Let's look at this another example, example one, where we can see this in action. Point O is the center of the circle above. If the area of the entire circle is 64 pi, what is the area of the shaded region? Okay, so if you saw this question on a test, I would want you to instantly recognize that it's a part over whole question. And the picture really helps us out, right? I mean, we have a whole circle with part of it shaded. So if I saw this, I would instantly write part over whole on my page. And I think that this is an important step. The SAT is counting on you to get all lost in your head because you're doing a bunch of work logically instead of putting it on the page. And so that's an important thing. If you write stuff down, it comes out of your brain and onto the page, freeing up space for you to do the next step or think about the problem a different way. So always show your work but don't do stuff in your head. Put it on the page. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you out and make you move through the problem faster. And so once I've got this down, I've actually started to kind of figure out what needs to happen next. I know that I need to start making fractions that relate parts of the circle to the whole circle. And if I look at this particular picture, they give me some information about the part. They tell me that that angle measure is 67.5 degrees. Well, let's put that in my fraction. And I know that a whole circle always has 360 degrees. So just like that, I've already got a fraction that kind of represents what's going on in this picture. Now, going into the question, there's, there's something else that they want. They don't care about the fraction per se. They care about the area of the shaded region. So we don't know that, that's going to be one of these answer choices, but for now we can represent that with an X. We want to just have a placeholder because most part over whole questions are going to involve two fractions. So we're going to set this equal with the part on top, the part is the X, the area of the shaded part, and we need to then put that over the whole area for the circle. In this case, they actually are really nice and give it to us. The area of the entire circle is 64 pi. So let's write that on the bottom. And this is how most part over whole questions are going to look. They're going to have two fractions set equal to each other. Not always. We're going to see some exceptions in the exercise, but this is really kind of like the basic version of a part over whole question. And once we get to this point, we can start to solve for x. If we have 
two ratios set equal to each other. We've got four different pieces and three of them we know and we can use that to then solve for the fourth one that we don't, the x in this case. And how do we do that? Well, we're going to cross multiply and then divide. So cross multiplying, we get 360 times x is equal to, and this is definitely a place for your calculator, nothing wrong with that, but when we put it in our calculator, we're going to do 67 and a half times 64 and get 4,320, and we're going to leave the pi as is. For whatever reason, my students just love to multiply by 3.14. They love to just multiply pi out and use the decimal or the button on the calculator. I really don't know where this came from. You almost never need to do this in math. That's why we have the symbol, because 3.14 is a pain in the neck to deal with. So on the SAT and ACT, you're almost always going to keep it as a symbol. Maybe on the first day of geometry class in school, that's like the first thing you learned is pi is 3.14. And then like it just became a, a, a reflex that you have. It's a bad habit. Don't multiply it out. We are going to see an exception in the exercise. But again, that's an exception. Most of these problems are going to involve pi as a symbol. And it's either going to be in the answer choices like it is here or it's going to kind of cancel out and we won't have to deal with it at all. So if we keep it this way, we still use our calculator to divide by 360, and that's going to leave us with x is 12 pi. And that is the answer, and that is answer choice B. That's it. This is a basic part over whole question. It is going to get harder than this. They're going to twist it up in lots of different ways, but what I want you to keep in mind as we go through more questions is that the, the basic version of a part over whole question is going to involve two fractions usually. Or even if not, it's going to at least involve some version of a part over whole fraction. So put that on the page. It's a great place to start when you're doing them. In this particular question, like I said before, they were nice to us and gave us that the area is 64 pi. They're not always going to do that. Sometimes you're going to need to figure the area out for yourself, and that's okay. Just remember that the SAT gives you this reference chart at the beginning of both math sections. Part over whole questions might require the circumference and area formulas or the angle constants. A circle has 360 degrees and 2 pi radians. You should never get a part over whole question wrong because you forgot one of these facts at least not on the SAT. The ACT, unfortunately, does not give you these formulas, so you need to memorize them if you're studying for the ACT. Now, not all part over whole questions are going to be as straightforward as the one we just did, so let's look at some ways that they're going to twist the question to make it harder to recognize. The twists. Like all geometry questions, the SAT likes to disguise familiar questions so that they appear new and confusing. Chances are, if a question involves part of a circle, it's a part over whole question. And just looking at the picture, you can tell that this is a part over whole question because part of the circle is highlighted. You can also tell that it's going to be much more complicated than the last example because there's all this other stuff going on. But those twists should not prevent us from answering this question. Let's take a closer look at it. In the figure above, point O is the center of the circle, and segments JL and KL are tangent to the circle at points J and K, respectively. If the radius of the circle is 10, what is the length of arc JK shown in bold? Okay, so this question is definitely harder, but remember that the theme of this video is narrow your focus. So before we were talking about narrowing our focus to just part over whole questions so that we weren't distracted by the other 57 questions and we could learn the pattern for these. But when you're confused on a specific question on the SAT, you can also narrow your focus to get yourself unstuck, to worry about the twists later and not let them distract you from the start. So if I saw this question, I want to narrow my focus right away because I can see they're giving me a part of a circle. So we're going to do the same thing that we did last time, put that part over whole on the page, get it out of your brain, get it here, and now focus on what that means. In this particular case, they tell us that, uh, they tell us all this information about the circle, but focus on the end, what is the length 
of arc JK. Well, that's this bolded piece, and just like before, we don't know what it is, so we're going to call it X. We're going to use a placeholder for now. And because I've narrowed my focus to just these part over whole uh, fractions, we can now say we know that one of the parts is this X. Now, what is the whole that corresponds with it? If X is part of the way around the circle, what's the whole way around the circle? Well, that's the circumference. And they don't give us that like they did the area on the last question, but they, they do good enough. So they do tell us that the radius of the circle is 10. So if we put that on there, we now can actually get the circumference by using our reference chart. We're going to know that the circumference is 2 pi times the radius. So the circumference in this case is 2 pi times 10, which is 20 pi. So now we've got a part over whole fraction, exactly what we need. And just like last time, we're probably going to need another one of these, though this time it's a little bit less clear where to go. So this is where we've got to kind of just look at the question, look at some twists, look at what's going on, and, and maybe take some guesses if we're confused. I'm immediately drawn to this angle L. It's the only other piece of information that's, that's on the picture, and so the fact that it's an angle makes me think I'm going to need angles to solve this. And so I know the whole number of angles, the whole number of degrees in a circle is 360. That always is the case. Now, I don't know the part, the part of the angle that corresponds to this bolded piece, which is this orange here. I don't know this. So for now, I'm going to kind of have to give it a placeholder for it. Let's call it Y just to give it some kind of name. And you can see that we've made an equation that's very similar to the one that we made on the basic version of this question on example one, except this time we only have two of the four parts that we need. If we had three of the four, we could solve for that fourth, and so that means that Y is the thing for us to now narrow our focus on. So how can we get Y? Well, I'm looking at all the angles, I see that, that 36 is on the other side, I'm probably going to need to work my way towards the Y. Is there anything in the question that they've given us that we haven't used? It's very rare for the SAT to give us some information that we don't end up using to solve the question. It happens occasionally, but it's very rare. So if we go back to the question, they actually tell us that uh, the lines JL and KL are tangent to the circle at points J and K respectively. That means that these lines and these angles right here are going to form 90 degree angles. This is just a fact that you need to know for geometry. Lines that are tangent to circles form 90 degree angles. So that really helps us out because now it's, it still might be hard to see, but what we really have here is a four-sided figure. Here we go, one, two, three, four, and four-sided figures, kind of like circles, have 360 degrees. And so I've got one, two, three of those angles, and there's my fourth one right there, that's opposite Y. So if I can find that fourth one, I can find Y. And we can do this now by subtracting our angles. So we know that there's 360 degrees in that whole four-sided figure. We've got two 90s and that 36. We can subtract them. Another opportunity is your calculator, but it's going to get 144 degrees left. So this angle here, I'll just fill it in, is 144. Okay, It's getting small, but stay organized. Show your work, but stay organized. So if that's 144, I can find Y because the Y plus the 144 makes a full circle, okay? So we can even just write that as an equation, 144 plus Y equals 360. So let's find Y by subtracting out that 144, and we are left with 216 degrees. It's a mess. It's a mess, but we're there now. And look, if we know that y is 216 degrees, we can replace that in our proportions, 
And now we have three of the four pieces. Now we are back to basics. We can go and do exactly what we did in the last question. So there was some stuff that got in the way, some twists that made this a pain, but now we're back to familiar territory. So we can cross multiply and we get 360x equals 4,320 pi. Use your calculator, but keep it as pi. And then divide by 360. And actually, just by coincidence, we're going to get 12 pi again. Choice B, again. It's a longer question. It is a harder question. But at bottom, the core of the question is still the same as it was before. Hard over whole. And so when you see this on the exercise, on the real test, anytime you see parts of circles, I want you instantly thinking part over whole. Write it on the page. It should be a reflex. Yeah, there's going to be other things that twist it up and make it hard, but focus on the thing that you know. Narrow your focus to what you know, and you'll be surprised how far you can get even when the question is really, really hard. Now you're going to put what you learned in the examples into practice. This exercise has five part over whole questions. They're not all going to look exactly like the two that we did together, but no matter how different they may seem, you'll notice that they're all asking about a part of a circle. Narrow your focus to that piece of the question. Start by writing part over whole on the page, and I think you'll find that there is a fairly consistent pattern to solve these. If you've downloaded the free workbook from my website, then you already have this exercise on the next page. But for those of you who can't download it, I'll put each question up on the screen for five seconds. Pause the video and try to work through it. Afterwards, I'll give you the answers and the explanations. Good luck! All right, now before we get to the questions, one thing to point out, all five of the questions in this exercise were what are called free response questions, or what I call grid-ins sometimes. Basically, they don't have answer choices for us to pick. And a lot of people think that that makes them harder than the other questions on the SAT, but that's just not true. The level of difficulty is roughly the same. There are easy grid-ins, there are hard grid-ins, and so don't worry about the fact that you don't have an answer choice. In fact, a lot of the times, the answer choices are there to just trick you anyway. So treat every question like it's a free response and just do the work and count on your process to get you the answer rather than the, just the fact the answer is there. So when we look at this question, instantly we can narrow our focus because we know it's a part over a whole question. We've got part of a circle shaded for us. So we should go ahead and write part over whole on our page so that our Focus is very narrow right here, and we can ask ourselves, what are the parts, what are the holes? In this case, they give us a part on the picture. We know that the angle measure for the shaded region is x degrees, so that's our part, and as always, the whole number of degrees in a circle is 360. So we ha already have one of our two fractions. For the other side, we've got to look at the question itself. It does tell us that the length of minor arc PQ is 3 pi, and that's this here, right here from P to Q. Let me just shade that for you. And so that's the part. We can put that on the top. And the whole is going to be the whole way around the circle, the entire outside, which is the, cir the circumference, which then fortunately they don't just give us, so we've got to figure it out, but they do tell us that the radius is 4, so we have all the tools that we need to actually get it. So that means we can use our reference chart to remind us that the circumference is 2 pi times the radius. So in this case, that's 2 pi times 4, or 8 pi. And now we've got, we've got three of the pieces of our familiar proportion. So if we've got three pieces, we can find the fourth. We're in good shape. So let's do what we always do. Let's cross multiply and divide. That's going to give us 8 pi x equals, in this case, 1080. 
oh, 1080 pi, let's not forget those. And when we do that, we can now divide by 8 pi. Our pi's will cancel, and we're going to be left with x is 135 degrees. And that's it. We're done. We found x. Nothing else to do. 135 is our answer for number one. Okay, so number two is tricky for a couple of reasons. The first thing you might notice is that there's no picture. And we're very used to there being a picture for part over whole questions. There almost always is. Let's put that aside for now. There's going to be another clue that tells us this is a part over whole question. But more importantly, you might notice that this question is talking about radians. And that's something a lot of tutors are going to associate with trigonometry. And they're not wrong to do that, but I like to think of these usually as having to do with part over whole, because it's not really about sine, cosine, and tangent. This is really just asking about a circle, and it's asking about a part of a circle. So if you want to do a question like this with the uh, conversion between degrees and radians, if you know that formula, great. But I have a feeling that if you have trouble with stuff like this, you don't know those formulas. But that doesn't mean you can't get this right. What we should notice instantly is that this question is talking about a fraction of a circle. That's what part over whole questions are. They're fractions of circles. So we should do the same thing we do every time and make our part over whole fraction. That gets us to narrow our focus on what's really going on here and ignore the fact that it's a radians question. That's not really as important. Now, we are given some important information, but not in the question. In the reference chart, they tell us the whole number of radians in a circle is 2 pi. That's given to you. You do not need to memorize that, at least for the SAT. Now we just need to find a part that goes with this. And they tell us that the central angle is 7 pi over 8 radians. And without a picture, that seems hard to understand, but it's really the same thing that we've always had. We have some sort of central angle, and they care about that part of the circle. So the 7 pi over 8 is our part. It's annoying still because we've got a fraction within a fraction, but that's really all we've got left here. If we look and try to find another fraction, we're going to get stuck because they don't give us any new information. There's, they ask about the circumference, but they don't give us a radius. They don't give us a part of the circumference. So we have no other thing to set this equal to. And that's another twist, but it actually doesn't matter. They want the fraction, right? We have the fraction. We're done. All we need to do is simplify this and turn this into a, a number that we can grid in into our answer form. So in this particular case, they're really just asking, do you know how to deal with fractions within fractions? The easiest way, I think, is to make them both fractions. So let's put that 2 pi over 1 so that I can see I have a little parallel structure going on here, a fraction on the top and a fraction on the bottom. And the process is going to be multiply the top by the reciprocal of the bottom. So we take our 2 pi over 1 and we flip it and it becomes 1 over 2 pi and we multiply that by the numerator which stays the same. It's still 7 pi over 8. Now we cross or we multiply across the tops and across the bottom. That's how we multiply fractions like this and that's going to give us 7 pi over 16 pi, and those pi's will cancel out, leaving us with an answer that we can bubble in our answer form, 7 over 16. So that's it. Radians, no picture, a little bit weird, but it's still a part of our whole question, and the fact that it says fraction of a circle is the thing that gives it away. All right, for number three, this looks very intimidating. It looks really weird. You've got a weird shape in here, and so a lot of people get nervous. But remember, narrow your focus. Think about what they're asking here. They want the length of minor arc BD. Well, let's shade that in, kind of like we usually do. And, it, and look, it, it's part of the circle there. So we should call it X like we always do, and we shouldn't rush here. Our reflexes should kick in, and we want to make our part over whole fraction. So it may look weird, but once we recognize that it's part of a circle that they're asking about, 
We should be putting part of our whole on our page. Let it focus our mind on what's really going on. So we've got our first part, is the X. And what's the whole that corresponds with that part? What's the whole way around the circle, the whole circumference? Well, in this case, they were nice. They told us it's 100. We don't need to figure it out for ourselves. We can just write it there. And now we're going to need to figure out the other side. This one does have two ratios that we need. A lot of people are going to do something like this. They're going to make a central angle and say, OK, I want the angle that opens up to minor arc BD. Totally fine. You can get that. You can take 360 degrees and you can divide it by 5 because it's a pentagon and it has 5 sides and you can figure out all those angles. But you don't have to. The best thing about part over whole is it doesn't matter what aspects of the part and the whole we're thinking about. We usually think about degrees and area, circumference, radians, but we don't have to. The point is that the fraction is consistent. So we can be clever here. If we ignore the angle for a second, we can still divide this circle into different parts. Let's just draw a bunch of radii to all these different pieces and you'll see a pentagon is going to divide a circle into five parts. So there we go. How many whole, what's the whole number of parts here? What's the whole of this pentagon? It's five. And what do we care about? They want us to get one, two of the parts. So we want two-fifths of the circle. We go right at the fraction here. That's totally fine. And notice again, even though this was weird, it ends up looking very much like the basic part over whole question that we started with. Now we can just do what we always do, cross multiply and divide. So we get 5x equals 200. Divide by 5, and you're going to get that x is 40. And that's our answer. So again, it's very different from the other part over whole questions in certain ways. But it's fundamentally the same. And so narrow your focus to what pops in a question, the thing that you can latch onto that you understand, and you'd be surprised even the weird stuff tends to be pretty familiar. It follows the usual pattern if you can recognize what kind of question you're dealing with. All right, number four, very obviously a part over whole question. There's a part of a circle shaded. This should be routine at this point. You should have that pattern down. So we're going to write part over whole. And we're going to ask ourselves, what parts do we know? What holes do we know? Well, they give us this part. The angle is 40 degrees of our shaded region. So we've got that. And there are always 360 degrees in a circle. So right off the bat, we've got half of our uh, proportion. We've got a whole fraction there. And now we've got to make sure we can fill out the other side. So they're asking for the radius, but if we ask ourselves, what other parts do we know? What other holes do we know? In this case, we do know that the area of the shaded region is pi. So that's the area here, the area of the part. So that's going to be the numerator of our fraction. And we don't know the whole area. Instead of saying x on the bottom, I'm actually going to say a. And that's basically because I don't want to accidentally solve for x and assume that I'm done. The SAT loves to do that. They know that you're just like conditioned to have x equal something and then just be done with the question in math. So they kind of mess with you a little bit. So just make sure you label things well. If you get into this habit of um, underlining, making sure you understand what they're asking for, it'll prevent you from stopping short and failing to completely answer a question. So in this case, I know they want the radius, so I'm not going to just stop when I find my value of a. I'm going to keep going. But it's a familiar proportion. We can cross multiply and divide like we always do. So I'm going to get 40a equals 360 pi divide by 40 and I'll get a is 9 pi. So I know my area and I know my area formula is pi r squared. That's given in the reference chart for the SAT but you should probably memorize it. It seems to come up quite a bit. We can divide by pi to cross those out on both sides. So we're left with 9 
is equal to the radius squared. Take the square root, and you get that the radius is 3. Now we have exactly what they asked for, and we're done with the question. So there's a little bit of a twist that makes this question longer than the basic part of our whole question that we saw at the beginning of the video, but it's really not that different. Same part over whole, same sets of fractions, just a little bit of an extra thing at the end. That's all. Okay, now this number five is going to be a little bit of a pain. There's a lot of twists that they're throwing at us here, but fundamentally, this is still a part over whole question. That should be really obvious at this point. You've got a circle, part of it is shaded. Just follow through. Don't get lazy here. Put part over whole on your page. Start asking questions. What parts do we know? What holes can we fill out here? So when we do that, we can automatically see that they want the angle here. Angle X, that is the part of that shaded region that they care about. The whole number of degrees in a circle, still 360 degrees. So we've already got half of our fraction, and now we need to go into the question itself to get the other side. And when we do that, we can see that they are talking about the area of the shaded region, but they don't give us an exact value. They say it's between 10 and 11. So that's one of those twists that's kind of annoying. For now, let's keep that aside because it doesn't really give us a number to put anywhere. But we still have one other piece of information, and that's the radius is 5. So we can put that on our picture. And since they're talking about area, we should probably find the whole area. We've got the part, we want the whole. So the whole area is going to be pi r squared. That's in the reference chart. Area equals pi times 5 squared. So in this case, our area is 25 pi. So that's going to be the denominator of the other ratio that we're setting up, the other part over whole fraction. But looking at this, we're close to the place we want to be, but we're not quite there. Remember, if we have three of these four pieces, we can solve. We can find the fourth. But right now, we've only got two. So we need that third. We need that part of the area. They tell us it's between 10 and 11. And this is a case where you've got to kind of trust yourself a little bit. I'm going to take them at their word. I'm going to be very little, literal here. If it's between 10 and 11, I'm going to say it's 10.5. Be right in the middle, and that's going to let me have some wiggle room in case I need to do some rounding later on, but I'm just following instructions at this point. Now we've got exactly what we're used to, so we can do exactly what we're used to. Okay, So we're going to cross, multiply, and divide. So we'll get 25 pi x and this is going to equal 3,780. Now we're going to need to divide by 25 pi to get x by itself, but notice we don't have another pi here for our pi to cancel out with. So we've only got one, and that means that this is the exception to the rule that I said at the beginning. In this particular case, you do need the pi button on your calculator. Okay, This is the rare exception. Now. Another thing to note, when you divide by pi here, you've got to make sure you do it right. In your calculator, it should say 3,780 divided by is going to be that slash, parentheses 25 pi. You need to divide by the 25 and by the pi together. If you leave off those parentheses and you just do 3,780 uh, 3, divided by 25 pi without the parentheses, you will get the wrong answer. The reason is it will first divide by 25, then it will multiply by pi. So it's, the calculator follows those rules of PEMDAS very strictly. So the, the takeaway here is, you know, this is a hard question, but in general, if you're using the calculator, you want to be really precise. When in doubt, throw some more parentheses in there. You can even do 25 pi first and then divide 3,780 by that weird decimal. But whatever the case, be very, very careful. If you do everything right, you should get that x is equal to 48.128 blah, blah, blah. Okay? But there's one other twist. They do not want 48.128 blah, blah, blah. They want an 
integer value of x. An integer is a whole number, so we need to round this to a much more manageable number. In this case, I just multi uh, rounded to 48 because it's close. And the reason I feel comfortable doing that without checking is that I picked the middle number to start, 10.5. That number is in the middle, so that allowed me to kind of have that extra space on either side so I could do this rounding at this point. But this is not the only answer to this question. There are lots of answers depending on what number you pick from the start. And so you can get 46, 47, 48, 49, and 50. All of those are acceptable answers. And so they just depend on what you pick to start or how you do it. You might end up with a different answer. But I like going literally in the middle when I'm told and just playing it safe. Well, that's it for part over whole questions. We did seven of them in total. That should be enough that you'll know exactly what to do if you see a question about a part of a circle on a real test. Write your part over whole fraction on your page and start filling in what you know. It might not be exactly like the questions we saw, but it'll be close. Close enough that you should be able to guarantee yourself those 10 points on the real SAT. It may not seem like much, but now you can narrow your focus to the next topic and practice until you guarantee those 10 points. Then the next topic and the next 10 points and so on, and before you know it, you'll have some really great scores. Big picture, the SAT and ACT are overwhelming because they test so many topics. But the more you can narrow your focus, the better. When you get something wrong on a practice test, look for more questions of that type. There will be twists that make the questions different, but there will also be similarities that you can use to help you get it right the next time. Narrow your focus to the piece of the question that you understand, it'll at least get you started. You should visit my website for more help on narrowing your focus, and you may also want to consider buying my SAT Math Packets prep book because it's designed to help you focus on these narrow topics one at a time. In the next video, we'll look at another topic, and I'll also talk about what to do when you're feeling intimidated by the SAT and ACT. A lot of times this happens when you have scores that are a little bit lower than your grades, and it's easy to feel discouraged. But you can improve your scores the same way that you improve your grades. Hard work is a form of intelligence, and the SAT and ACT reward you for it. If this video helped you out, then you can return the favor by subscribing to my channel. That helps me out, and it also lets me know that I should make more videos. You should also follow me on Instagram for free daily test prep, and please comment if you have questions. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in video number three.